you have a copy of God's Word, please turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, as we can continue in our regular exposition of this gospel, we come this morning to Matthew chapter 3, and I'd like us to read verses 1 through 12. Queen Elizabeth II died a little less than a month ago, and a friend of mine, a member of the church, reminded me of an oath that she took at her coronation in 1953. She was presented with a ceremonial Bible there as she's being crowned queen. And the Archbishop of Canterbury said this to her, We present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. She was wearing a crown with nearly 3,000 precious gems and stones on her head. She was in one of the world's ancient cathedrals. She was to assume an ancient throne, and yet the Word of God was revered as the most wonderful thing this world affords. May God give us a similar estimation of His Word as we read it now. Matthew 3, follow along as I read, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, now we come to this moment in our service where we bring ourselves, as it were, under your word. And so we pray that you would come and speak to us by the Bible, and that you would bring to us conviction and exhortation and edification and power through your spirit. All these things that you promise will be the effect of your word upon your people. Please come now and bless the work of preaching, the work of hearing. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen. I understand that within our church, we have many here who are fans of classical music. We also have many fans of Broadway plays and musicals uh, here in our church. If you're familiar with some of the greatest multi-piece productions of classical music, or if you're familiar with the usual structure of Broadway plays, you're surely familiar with the idea of the overture. The overture. The overture is usually the first piece uh, in uh, a multi-piece work of classical music or sometimes in a Broadway play. It's the first piece of the Broadway production. And the function of the overture is to introduce to the audience a certain themes and motifs and, and musical ideas that are going to come up later in the production to a fuller degree. Okay, so if you were to listen to Bach's St. Matthew's Passion, 
I always listen to that around uh, the time of Easter every year. If you listen to Handel's Messiah, uh, they're going to be performing Handel's Messiah just down the road at Wake Chapel over at Wake Forest. I warmly encourage you to come out for that. That'll be in December. I think some of us are going to that. There's an opening orchestral piece, an overture that in some ways introduces what are going to be some of the major themes of the music picked up later on. So later in the uh, uh, the, the piece of music, the, the, the later pieces in the symphony or the work or whatever you're listening to, you recognize themes that you first heard at the outset in kind of seed form. Uh, you can think of Broadway plays like Les Miserables or The Phantom of the Opera, a more recent production, Hamilton. That opening song is crucial. You can't miss that opening overture because what the opening overture is doing is acclimating you to the characters, the themes, introducing them in such a way that when you hear of them later in the production, they're more familiar to you and you're ready to understand those themes and motifs in greater depth because they've at least been introduced to you kind of in seed form there at the outset of the production. Okay, so the ministry of John the Baptist in all four gospel accounts, at least in its initial phase, John the Baptist features prominently at the beginning of every gospel, his ministry functions as a kind of overture to each gospel. Uh, introducing some major themes in his ministry that the writer of the gospel is going to pick up later on and develop as the narrative of the gospel sort of unfolds. So this is certainly how it works in the gospel of Matthew. We're still here in the opening movements of Matthew's gospel. The adult Jesus entering his public ministry has not entered the scene yet. Last week we considered uh, Jesus' early, early childhood in, in Matthew 2. Uh, he's going to appear in Matthew 3 verse 13 at his baptism, prepared now to enter into his adult public ministry. But that's not happened yet. We're still kind of in those opening movements of the play. We're still in the overture. And John here in verses 1 through 12 is introducing some major themes and motifs and ideas that are going to be picked up and further developed later on in Matthew's gospel. So I'll just highlight a few of the themes that are introduced in the passage we just read. First of all, there's the introduction of this idea of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. The theme of the kingdom of heaven often referred to as the kingdom of God in other gospels, same idea, no difference between the two. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is one of the most major themes in all of the gospel. In fact, so much so that Matthew is often referred to as the gospel of the kingdom. The word kingdom is going to be used some 55 times or so in Matthew's gospel. And here's the first reference to it. John begins his preaching by announcing, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's introducing this idea of the kingdom that will be developed later on. He's introducing also, secondly, the idea of repentance. Repentance of sin, confession of sin, which is going to be a pronounced theme in Matthew's gospel. He's going to introduce the idea of conflict with the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus will later engage in severe conflict with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but it starts with John, who calls him a brood of vipers and tries to expose their hypocrisy in coming to his baptism. That idea of conflict between God's people, and particularly Jesus and the religious leaders of the day, could be a major theme in Matthew's gospel. There also is the idea of the coming judgment. And just as the theme of the Lord's kingdom is prominent in Matthew's gospel, the idea of judgment coming, the looming judgment of God, is never more prominent in any of the gospels than in Matthew's gospel, and maybe no more prominent in the rest of the Bible, save for maybe Revelation. A theme of the coming judgment of God upon humanity is a prominent theme that we'll see later on developed. And then, of course, the dawning of the age of the Holy Spirit. Uh, John is going to prophesy about Jesus coming baptism. He will baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. So any more material on the Holy Spirit presented as we move through this gospel. We're going to see in this passage this morning, Matthew 3, an anticipation of much that is to come in the rest of the gospel. We're still in the opening stages and things are being set for Jesus' ministry, which is about to begin in verse 13. Uh, he will arrive on the scene in his public ministry at his baptism later on in this chapter. But right now the stage is being set. The overture is being played, if you will. Now, I was originally, it was my plan early in the week, even by the middle of the week, to preach all of verses 1 through 12 in this one sermon. But I found I couldn't even get past the first two verses. And candidly, couldn't even get past the first word of verse 2, Okay. So that's a problem because these verses hold together in a major way. So think of this sermon as part one to a sort of two-part mini-series on Matthew 3, 1 through 12. We're going to introduce some ideas in this sermon. And then next time we're in this gospel together, we'll look at the second half of this passage in Matthew 3, 1 through 12. This morning, what I'd simply like to do 
is introduced to you John the Baptist. Uh, and then I would like to begin to introduce the major burdens of his preaching ministry. And I want to focus on one burden of his preaching ministry in particular. So two headings this morning, I've chosen to state them in the form of questions. The first is, number one, who is John the Baptist? Who is John the Baptist? You can look again at verse one if you would. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first question we should ask is who is John the Baptist? There's no prelude to his ministry. Boom, he's on the scene in Matthew 3, verse 1. Who is John the Baptist? Simply put, John is one of the most significant figures in all of redemptive history. All four of the Gospels will highlight the relevance of the place of John the Baptist in redemptive history. He features prominently in the beginning of every one of the Gospel accounts. Now, to understand his relevance, we must start by appreciating something of the context in which John appears. Uh, so think of the Israelite people. We had some sermon series about the history of Israel uh, in the Old Testament over the summer, in part to prepare us for this series in Matthew. Think of the Israelite people and what we know about them. God had, throughout the centuries, going back 2,000 years, he had sent them prophets, sent prophets to them to reveal something of his person and his will to the people of Israel. Even Abraham is said to be a prophet. Uh, uh, in, in Genesis 20, uh, Abimelech is praying to the Lord and God says, Abraham is my prophet. Uh, Moses was said to be a prophet. During the times of the monarchs, there were prophets. And then certainly we have the prophets that came to Israel in the context of their rebellion and their sin and their eventual exile. So we have a whole section in our Bibles that we refer to as the prophets. Uh, men like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, many of the minor prophets as well. The Lord would send prophets to his people to communicate his purposes and his will for the people. Sometimes they would pronounce judgments. Sometimes they would offer a word of hope. Many times they would reveal things about the coming kingdom and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he would be and what his kingdom would be like. The Lord sent prophets to his people. Uh, but then, we spoke about this a few Sundays ago, you have that white blank page in most copies of your Bible between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That white blank page between Malachi and Matthew symbolizes 400 years of silence. God was no longer sending prophets to Israel. 400 years of silence. God's people are no longer in the land. There is no king on David's throne. It seems that all the promises that God had made, they just sort of all fall into the wayside, and God is no longer sending prophets to his people. But one of the things we're told in the Old Testament, a couple of passages, is that God would one day send a prophet who would announce the coming of the Christ. There would one day come another prophet. He would announce the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Christ, and the dawning of the Messianic age. And this prophet would be a kind of transitional figure. This prophet would mark the shift of the ages, the inauguration of a new epoch, the coming of the Lord himself. And in a sense, he would be the last prophet of that age that was coming to an end. In him, one chapter of redemptive history would close, and a new chapter of redemptive history would open. He would be this pivot figure, this transitional figure, and he would come to announce the opening of this new chapter, the dawning of this new age in the coming of the Messiah. There was this promise that in time, perhaps even when things looked bleakest, God would once again send a prophet. Okay, John the Baptist is that prophet. Matthew emphasizes this, as does every gospel writer, all four of the gospel writers, will connect John to a number of passages. All of them, though, will connect him to Isaiah 40 and verse 3. We have that passage quoted for us in verse 3 of Matthew 3. If you look at verse 3 with me, for this is he, John is he, this is he, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And Matthew doesn't go on to quote the subsequent verses, but Luke in his gospel, when he connects John the Baptist to this passage, he will quote two more verses in Isaiah 40. So Matthew's quoted verse 3. He will quote verses 4 and 5 also, which say this, every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. John, we're told by all four gospel writers, 
is the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now we're going to learn a lot more about John the Baptist. There's much more material about him in Matthew's gospel. I'm not going to look at all that material now, but I do want to put one passage in your minds at this point. Turn over to Matthew 11, if you will. Just a few pages on in Matthew's gospel to Matthew chapter 11. This is one of the most pivotal passages in all of scripture to understand who John the Baptist was and what role he plays in redemptive history. Matthew chapter 11 We're breaking into the narrative here, and you're going to notice a lot that is mysterious about this passage. We're going to expound this passage, God willing, when we get to it a few months from now, or a few years from now, or whatever the case may be. Matthew 11, verse 9, we're breaking into this scene here. Here's what Jesus says to the people. Matthew 11, verse 9, what then did you go out to see? Talking about those who went out to see John the Baptist. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Then he quotes Malachi 3.1, another prophecy about this prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. He's saying there has arisen no greater prophet in the history of Israel, no greater figure in the history of Israel than John the Baptist. He is the greatest And he is, in some sense, the last of the prophets. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews opens up with that great statement. In times past, the Lord has spoken through the prophets. Now he's spoken by his son. John's going to be the last prophet that comes to speak. And then Jesus says in the second half of verse 11, Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God was not used in the Old Testament. A new age is dawning in the kingdom of heaven. A new epoch has come. And in this epoch, this new age, which is far better than the previous age, even the least in the kingdom of heaven will be counted better than the greatest in the previous epoch, the previous age, who is John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I said there's a lot that's mysterious about this passage, and we will expound it later, God willing, but I want to just highlight this simple point. John the Baptist is clearly understood to be this transitional figure. He is the last of the prophets. He is the greatest of the prophets. And up until him, a certain era, a certain epoch, a certain age was transpiring. But now in him there is a shifting of the ages. God is doing something new. A new age has opened up. The kingdom of heaven has now dawned. But this John has a key role to play in redemptive history. He's the swing figure. His ministry is the one that marks the shift of the ages, the end of one age and the coming of another. He is the last of the prophets. And now a new age, the age of the kingdom, the age of the Christ is beginning, and John is the one appointed to announce its beginning. So, so who is John? He's this transitional figure in redemptive history, this pivot figure in redemptive history, announcing the shift of the ages. The old age is coming to an end. The new age, the kingdom of heaven, is beginning. But there's more to John's ministry we should highlight. Appreciate this now. John was not only to announce the transition of the ages and the coming of the Christ. He was also tasked and commissioned in a special way to preach the gospel itself. And in a sense, John is the first gospel preacher. He is the first one to proclaim salvation and the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. There's a beautiful passage that brings this out concerning John. It's actually in Luke's gospel. I won't ask you to turn there. Luke gives us far more information in his gospel about the conception and birth of John the Baptist. We considered this last year in our Christmas series, a little less than a year ago. But, you know, of course, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they are... John's parents, and Elizabeth miraculously conceived. She had been barren. Zechariah sort of disbelieves the word of the angel that this is going to happen. He asks the angel to give him a sign whereby he could trust the angel's word. And what happens to Zechariah? Maybe some of you children know what happened to Zechariah. The Lord strikes him mute. He's not going to speak until the child is born. As a symbol, a chastening uh, for his unbelief. And then, of course, you have the scene where Elizabeth sees Mary and both children are in the womb, and the baby within Elizabeth leaps because His Messiah is in his presence. Beautiful, beautiful account we have in Luke's gospel. Well, then, at the end of Luke 1, uh, the baby is born. John the Baptist is born, and his father, Zechariah, has his tongue loosened, 
and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesies over the child. And this is what he says in Luke 1, verse 76. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. John's given this task, this assignment, this wonderful privilege to give to the people of Israel the knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of their sins. He's saying John's going to be a gospel preacher. He's going to announce, he will be the first to announce God's solution to man's sin problem. He will be the first to announce that Jesus who is the Christ, that Jesus who is the Savior of his people, who will save his people from their sins. He's going to be the one to prepare the way for the Lord and herald the gospel for the first time, to give to the people the knowledge of salvation and the forgiveness of their sins. So these two ideas we have in John, he's to announce the shifting of the ages. That age is closed. A new age is dawning in the coming of the Christ. And he's to announce also the gospel itself, that there will be the forgiveness of sins for all those who come to Jesus Christ in repentance. Okay, so back to our passage, Matthew 3. These two ideas that I've just shared, the preaching of salvation through the forgiveness of sins and the shifting of the epics are highlighted, I think, in verse 2. And the summary of John's preaching that were given there. So we read verse 1 of Matthew 3, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. And now this is not the, 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 the exhaustive you know, sermon that he preached. It would be a two-second sermon. This is a summary of the central burdens in his preaching. Repent. And the other gospel writers say, repent for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel, forgiveness of sins proclaimed, the coming of of the kingdom, they come together in this summary. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now that message, the summary of John's message, will be verbatim the exact message that Jesus himself will preach. So if you were to look over just a page or two over to Matthew 4 verse 17, Jesus is now entering his public ministry as a preacher, and his preaching is summarized in the exact same way in Matthew 4 verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John's message is Jesus' message. So we have these two things, the command to repent, and then the reason given, which is the announcement that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the call to repentance and the reality of the coming kingdom, they're connected ideas. The fact that the kingdom of heaven, whatever that is, is dawning, should precipitate a certain response in us, and that response ought to be one of repentance. We're going to consider both of these ideas and their connection to one another because they're not just integral to John's preaching, they're integral to Jesus' preaching. And again, the overture, these are themes that are going to be taken up in a major way in the rest of the gospel. However, today, we won't get further than the first idea conveyed in that first word, repent. So next week, we'll talk about the kingdom of heaven and what that is and how that's connected to this idea of repentance. But this morning, under the second main heading, I just want to ask this last question. Who is John the Baptist? We've summarized his ministry Who he is is a transitional figure in redemptive history. The second question I want to ask is, what is repentance? What is repentance? This is his message, repent, at least one of the main burdens of his message. What is repentance? And I admit, I acknowledge freely before you, this sermon is about to become very much a topical sermon on the subject of repentance. But I think it's necessary. I think the need of the hour calls for it. Because I don't think in our context today we understand very well what biblical repentance is. So if we're going to do what John calls us to do in this context, we have to understand what repentance is. So secondly now consider with me what is repentance. Well, in our passage it's presented as an imperative, a command, a summons. You the people, you, my audience, repent. The Christ is coming, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what should you do? What should be the human response to these things, to these events, the coming of the Christ? And John's word, which is Jesus' word, is repent. He says, verse two, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I'll just highlight to you, you can hang on to this for next time, this is apparently what the people do. They do repent. 
because we read in verse 6, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. They respond to the message, and they start confessing their sins to God. And we learn a few verses on from there, actually, in verse 11, that this is what John's baptism would symbolize. John says in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. In other words, this baptism in itself is going to be a symbol of this reality that is taking place. You have confessed your sins, repented of your sins. His baptism will be associated with repentance. Well, Mark, in his gospel, sort of puts all this together neatly for us. He says, Mark 1, verse 4, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What is repentance? Well, John comes proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So simply put, in his preaching, John the Baptist is calling people to repentance that they would experience the forgiveness of their sins through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Remember, in Matthew's gospel, the Christ has already been introduced to us. The very first verse identifies Jesus as the Christ. But it's in verse 21 of chapter 1 that we're told his name will be called Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. This is what Jesus has come to do. He's going to be a Yeshua, a Joshua, a Savior, a Deliverer, but the deliverance he will bring will be an ultimate kind of deliverance, the very deliverance that we need. He'll save us from our sins. He hasn't come ultimately to deliver us from uh, political oppression or economic deprivation. No, he's going to go after the cancer itself and by the cancer all the symptoms that come along with it. He's going to save his people from their sins. That's how he's been introduced. And so John, the one who's preparing the way of the Lord, is only natural. It's only right that he would begin preparing that way by calling people to the acknowledgement of their sins, the repentance of their sins, the confession of their sins, because Jesus, the great Savior from sins, is coming. And so John comes to prepare the way, calling people to repentance. So the point I wish to emphasize this morning and the time that remains is simply this. In his preaching, John is announcing the need for men and women to repent of their sins if they are to be ready for the kingdom of heaven. The dawning of the kingdom means people need to prepare themselves. The dawning of the kingdom means the people need to prepare themselves. And how do they prepare themselves? What is the appropriate response to this news that the kingdom is dawning and that God's Son, the Christ, has come? The appropriate response, according to John, is one of repentance. Now there was a time when the idea of repentance was universally understood. We do not live in such a time. Do you hear anybody, let's just say outside of church, talk about repentance anymore? Uh, does anyone commend today repentance as a good and positive thing to do in response to your own failures, sins, evil in your life? When's the last time you've heard someone talk about repentance as a virtuous course of action to pe for people to take in response to their own sins? It's just sort of off the radar. No one's talking about it. You don't even hear the word anymore, let alone the idea properly expounded. Repentance is a non-category in our context today. And here's what's even more astounding and frankly disturbing. The doctrine of repentance has almost entirely evacuated evangelical preaching today. So you could go to the typical chapel services in most so-called Christian schools today. You could listen to message after message after message after message. Never hear the word repentance. You could go to many of the campus Bible studies or the large group events of groups like Young Life or Crew or things like that, and you could sit in message after message after Bible study after Bible study, never hear the word repentance. You could go into many evangelical churches all across our country in our own town, and you could sit under the preaching under message after message for months. And if you were waiting to hear the word repentance, let alone the biblical idea of repentance, you would still be waiting, just sort of evacuated evangelical preaching today. One of the scandals of contemporary Christianity in America is its deafening silence on the subject of repentance. And yet for John, that first preacher of the gospel, 
this is one of the main burdens of his preaching, and it will be so for Jesus also. So because this is our context in Winston-Salem in 2022, I feel the need for us to do some work here on this word repentance in order to understand what it is and what it isn't and why it is essential, and it is essential to our preaching of the gospel as it was for John and for Jesus. Okay, so the meaning of the word repent in the Bible is plain and unambiguous. The Greek word is metanoeo, metanoeo. This word is often defined as a changing of one's mind and will. A changing of one's mind and will. And that is at the heart of what this word means. But it's possible the force of the word is lost on us because of the ways we use language today. So I, I might say to you, uh, I might say to my wife on Tuesday, I might call her and say, you know, we're going to eat out tonight, and I'm feeling Chinese. And then call her an hour later, I changed my mind. I think we'll have Italian tonight. That's a flippant and trite thing, right? The changing of our mind. We don't put a lot of thought in the changing of our mind. We're subject to our feelings and our whims, and changing one's mind could be seen as a whimsical and trite and lighthearted kind of thing. That's obviously not the idea in the way the word is used in the Bible. So more needs to be said about the word if we're to truly understand it. So biblical repentance, metanoia, biblical repentance, in the way John is speaking of the idea here, involves both the transformation of one's mind and will concerning an issue and actually changing directional course as the result of one's change of mind and will. In this sense, repentance in the Bible is actually very near to the idea of conversion and regeneration. Repentance requires that we develop a whole new perspective and outlook and attitude from what we held previously and respond with a corresponding pattern of life that vindicates our change of mind. The way John will put it to the Pharisees and Sadducees later on in this passage, he tells them, go and bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, you can judge the genuineness and authenticity of true repentance by the fruit it produces. It's not wrong to look for evidences and fruits of repentance. John did it. There should be fruits that correspond with this purported change at a supernatural level that has taken place in the heart of the individual. And the fruit repentance produces is a repudiation of the old way of life and a desire to live a new way of life in righteousness and faith. Now, repentance in the Bible is always repentance of sin toward God. But it is always repentance of sin toward God. So in light of this definition of repentance, a changing, a transformation of mind and will leading to a changing of one's actions and pattern of life, what would it mean to repent of sin? So what does it mean for you? What does it mean for me to repent as we ought of our sins? It would mean, it would entail, that we change our entire perspective on our sin. Becoming haters of sin, where once we were lovers of sin. And turning from our sin, that is repudiating it, forsaking it, leaving it off in order that we would then walk in righteousness and faith and love before God. It involves a change at the level of our wills and our hearts and our affections with respect to sin. And we turn from it, we forsake it, and we live differently. Our whole attitude and posture toward our sin changes. That's why becoming a Christian is not a casual thing. It's described as passing from death to life, from darkness to light. For being one who hated the light, being a lover of the light, one who loved sin, and going to one who loves God and hates and puts off and forsakes sin itself. And notice repentance is always repentance toward God. There's a sense in which when we sin horizontally toward one another, we need to repent to one another. That shouldn't be an uncommon sort of experience because we often sin against each other. We should know how to repent to one another. But there's a sense in which every single sin is a sin vertically. All sin is committed against God ultimately. It's one of the reasons why David could say, maybe if you've wondered in Psalm 51, David says, he's sinned against a lot of people, but he says to the Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. A sense that before him I'm specially accountable, specially answerable. All sin is a rebellion against his royal law 
against his will and done under his plain view. And there's a need to go to him. It's toward God that we repent. And in repentance, we're saying, God, you are right. What you say about my sin is right. It is sin. It's wrong. I turn from it. I forsake it. Teach me now to live in the paths of righteousness. This kind of repentance is what John is calling the people to do in his preaching. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from your sin and turn now through Christ, through the Lord, unto God. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now this understanding of repentance and this summons to repentance in our passage is a major refutation of a number of errors that are afoot in our day. I'm just going to mention two. Okay, this this teaching on repentance, the biblical view of repentance, as I've just stated it, is a refutation of two huge errors that are prevalent in our day that we need to be alert to. The first error is a kind of preaching of the gospel that does not require repentance at all. A kind of preaching of the gospel that does not require repentance at all of anybody. The second error is the presentation of the gospel that requires a kind of repentance, but such a watered-down notion of repentance as to resemble nothing at all of what the Bible identifies as true repentance. So there's kind of preaching we hear that there's no repentance in the message at all. There's no need to repent of your sins. Very prevalent. And then there's the kind of preaching of a kind of repentance that is just not within leagues of what the Bible describes as true repentance. So consider with me the first error. A presentation of the gospel that does not require repentance. From what I hear of much preaching today, as I said, repentance is just sort of gone. It's just not on the radar screen. I, I hear sermons chiefly through sermons people send to me. I see preaching online and YouTube preachers and things like that, links people share and things like that. I'm sometimes in other church settings, sometimes in chapel services and midweek events. That's where I get most of my preaching, so that's what I'm going off of here. Okay, this is the kind of presentation of the gospel I most often hear. It's something like this. Um, The preacher will be winding down his message, and uh, he will say something like, you know, do you ever feel unworthy? Do do you feel a sense of shame? Do you feel discounted? Do you feel unappreciated and sometimes used? And do you feel that you've been underestimated? That no one really sees what you're truly worth and no one appreciates how special you really are? Well, I have good news for you. Jesus, he loves you. And he knows how special you are. And he says to you, you're worthy. Uh, He he won't treat you like your friends treat you. Uh, He won't treat you like, like, like the bullies at school or in the university setting or maybe your family and the way they've discounted you. No, Jesus sees your worth and he'll help you be your true self. And he'll receive you and he'll love you. And he says over your life, you are worthy. Is that the gospel? What has just happened? The problem is not, in that view, that something is terribly wrong within me. You see that? The problem is that something is so spectacularly right within me, and here comes Jesus to affirm me, to stroke me, and tell me how great and awesome I really am. The problem is not my sin. The problem is that I'm underappreciated. The problem is that I'm underloved. I've been discounted. The people in my life have already treated me according to my real worth. But here comes Jesus. And he comes to tell me how awesome I am. And how wrong those people who fail to realize how awesome I am are. And what he will do eternally is to continue to affirm me. And how spectacularly wonderful and worthy and awesome I am. Is that the point to which the Bible and the gospel is meant to bring us? Bible people here, you know the Bible, you read the Bible. Is that the point to which the revelation of the sovereign God over all and His holiness and His righteousness that have been offended, 
And even the revelation of the gospel itself and the atonement of Jesus Christ, is that the point to which all that revelation is meant to give us? That I am so worthy and I just need someone to affirm me. No, that is not the point to which the Bible and the gospel is meant to bring us. The call of the gospel is a call to repentance. Because your greatest problem and my greatest problem is not that I'm underappreciated. It's not that I'm underaffirmed. Your problem and my problem is that we're sinners. And our sin separates us, everlastingly so, from God. That's the problem that the Old Testament speaks into. That's the problem Jesus came to resolve. And there will be no salvation, according to the Scriptures, apart from repentance. There is no gospel apart from repentance. The preachers of the New Testament make this clear over and over again. Over and over again. That first preacher of the gospel, John the Baptist, he preached it. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, when he enters his public ministry, as it's told us in Mark 1.15, says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. When Peter preaches the gospel in Acts chapter 2, stands up before the great crowds. He seeks to bring them to a place of the conviction of their sin. He tells them that they crucified the Lord of glory. And we read the responses that those who heard his message were cut to the heart. And they're left in a kind of holy hopelessness. What must we do? What can we do? If this verdict is true over me that I'm a sinner and under the just wrath of God, what can I do? And what does Peter say? He says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. When the apostle Paul in Acts 17 addresses the men in Athens, he says the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and that man is Christ Jesus. We read in Acts 20, in Ephesus, Paul testified of the need for Jews and Greeks to repent and to have faith toward God. Paul testifies at his trial before King Agrippa in Acts 26, verse 20. He says, I declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Friends, there is no getting around this. The call to repentance has always been a part of the faithful preaching of the gospel. There is no such thing as a call to Christ that doesn't involve a call to repentance. Let's just settle it. We are preaching something less than the biblical message of salvation if we don't include a call to sinners to repent and turn from their sins. But maybe you say, well, of course repentance is part of the gospel. It's in the Bible. I see the word there. Got to repent, you know, of course. But that does nothing to refute a second error that is also prevalent in our day, and that's those who preach repentance, but a kind of repentance that is something less than what we have in the Bible. It's really important that we all understand this here. Because because we, we can be, I think, fooled by this. Our notion of what repentance requires of us. So there are some who preach a doctrine of repentance that is little more than a feeling of remorse or regret about certain things in one's life. So the way you hear this, yeah, I have regrets. You know, and yeah, in that situation, that event, that episode from my past, I didn't, I didn't do too hot. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sign up for Jesus. And that notion, remorse and regret, is understood to be acceptable repentance. Some speak of repentance still almost as though repentance were simply feeling sad about one's situation and circumstances. You know, my life is not what I want it to be. Preacher, it's not really panned out, and so so I'm on board. I believe Jesus. I'm sad about where my life is and my situation. I, I see it's not going too hot. Sadness over circumstances is not repentance. Or perhaps we hear repentance talked about as though repentance is little more than a new resolution to get one's act together or to try harder or to be a better version of oneself. But friends, none of these things will do if we're to think biblically. Let's be clear. What does repentance require of you? What does repentance require of me? What is John requiring of you? 
What will Jesus require of you? What do Peter and Paul require of you in biblical repentance? And we need to be as clear as possible on this because the eternal fate of every soul in this room hangs on this. Because this is the call of the gospel. What must I do to be saved? God calls you and me to repent of our sins, which means God calls you to agree with him about your sin. That your actions, your words, your thoughts have betrayed a heart of sinful and prideful rebellion against God. Biblical repentance requires us to see our sin for what it is and in our hearts and out loud to call it what it is before God and to beg for his forgiveness, asking him to cover our sins in unmerited favor, mercy, and grace. And further, repentance requires that we pledge ourselves to him, that we turn from these sins and instead live according to his commandments and his will for our lives. Biblical repentance in the way John is talking about it here is the frank acknowledgement of sin before a holy God, a confession of sin, and a turning from sin such that we live new lives of righteousness as a result of our repentance. Repentance is meant to bring us low. And far from elevating and inflating our view of ourselves, it's to bring us to a holy kind of self-abasement. Lord, I'm nothing. I've sinned against you. You're a creature who ought to have lived for your glory. I've sinned against you. I've lived for myself. I've lived in sin. I've done wrong. I violated your law. And I am answerable to you, the thrice holy God, to whom I will give an account. And I come to you confessing my sins, repenting to you. The posture that the Bible's revelation about the holiness of God and man's sinfulness, the posture that it wants to bring us to is something like the posture of the publican in Luke 18. Do you remember that situation? The Pharisee comes and he's bloviating over how worthy he is and all the good works that he has done. But then there's the tax collector and he's described as standing afar off. He feels like he can't even come into the temple. Can I even approach him? He's so aware of his sin. Standing afar off, he wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. But he smote his breast and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is biblical repentance. That is the point to which the Bible and the gospel is meant to bring us. Any preaching of the gospel that doesn't require repentance is no gospel at all, and any form of repentance that doesn't humble us and lower us before God, but instead affirms us or inflates our view of ourselves or fails to rise above mere remorse and regret is a far cry from the Bible's view of repentance. Once more, Repentance is a frank and candid confession of sin to God leading to a transformed life. Repentance is forsaking of sin and a walking in righteousness. Repentance is a kind of self-abasement, but it is a self-abasement leading to life. It is a sick person coming to the physician for the cure. Repentance brings us low, ultimately to raise us up. But this is the call of the kingdom. John the Baptist, on the outset of the new age, the Christ is coming. What must we do? What should be our response to these things? Repent. Confess your sins. Go to God and say to Him, you are right and I'm wrong. I agree with you about my sin." I pronounce also my verdict in agreement with your verdict over my sin. I say, you are holy and I'm not. And I come and I say, have mercy on me, Lord. Pardon my iniquity. Forgive me of my sins. Last word before we transition to the Lord's table. I want to tell you two reasons. This is a sobering and grave subject. And I don't apologize if you're sobered by this. I think it's the effect the scriptures are meant to have on us. I want to tell you two reasons why this is really good news. Two reasons why the call to repentance is really good news. The first is, it gives us something to do with our sin. Okay? Gives us something to do. So so I believe this is true of every person here, whether you profess to be a Christian or not. I think you know you're a sinner. 
I think you know you're a sinner. I think you know there is a God. I think you know deep down in your heart of hearts that you are answerable to him and you violated his law and you're going to appear before his judgment. I think that's true of every person we meet. They know there is a God. It's resident in their conscience. It's hardwired into their DNA. They could deny it, but it's there. They could deceive themselves into thinking genuinely. They don't believe in him, but they know him. They know they're sinners. And I think most people are left in this situation that sin, the wicked things that we do, and I'll just speak from it. I've done all kinds of wicked things in my life, committed all kinds of sins. It's true of all of us. I think for most people that sin just sits there and resides and festers and brings about a kind of ruin and destruction in people's souls. People don't know what to do with it. It just sits there and festers and it destroys them and it gnaws at them. And it's probably the main underlying cause behind the rampant rise of hedonism in the world. Let me pursue pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Let me get another hit of that to sort of sedate my conscience and sedate my heart and, and, and the pangs of conscience that are speaking to me. You're a sinner and you're an answer to God. I think it's one of the reasons contributing to so much depression in the world, so much despair, so much suicide. Because, because if you're a sinner and you don't believe the gospel, what can you do? You can press it down. Or you could sedate yourself. Or you could distract yourself. And I think this is the underlying cause of why most people walk around actually miserable. I don't think most people are actually happy. I think they're actually miserable. And they're able by some kind of facade to make it appear that they're not. But friends, what repentance allows us to do is to do something with all that sin. We're no different from those who don't believe in God. We're sinners just like them. But see, repentance allows me to look my sin in the face and to call it what it is and to give my own verdict over my sin. Yes, it happened. Yes, it was wrong. I agree with the good and holy standards of God. I look it in the eye. I process it. I deal with it. I say what it is. There's something we can do with our sins through repentance. It's the the sort of hardwired human response to the evil that we find in our lives. We're meant to repent of the wrongdoing that we find in ourselves. We're meant to repent of evil thoughts and words and deeds and actions. It's supposed to be that way. There's something healthy about it. Repentance is good news because it gives us a way to handle our sin, something we can do with our sin. But the second reason the call to repentance is such good news is way more important than that. The reason repentance is such good news is because Christ promises in every single case of true repentance that he will do something with our sin. Listen, in the history of the world, you can read all throughout the Bible, wherever a man or a woman, a sinner, has engaged in genuine, true repentance, been given and developed a lowly and contrite spirit before God, comes to him confessing sin. In every single case, 10 times out of 10, God always forgives them. He doesn't call us to a regiment of penance. He doesn't consider our application. This is the promise of his word. If we as sinners come to him in repentance, he freely receives us. And he forgives us. You don't have to wonder. You're not on unfirm ground. It's not like a trial of some kind. If you go to God, will he receive me? Well, this is all I got. This is my shot in the dark. It's not that way. The sure promise of the Bible is that when a sinner comes to a place of true repentance, goes to God with their sins, he will remove it from them. He'll forgive them through what Jesus Christ, God's own son, has done on the cross. He will nail our sins to the tree as he nailed his sons to the tree. And he will banish them forever. Our sins that so easily ensnare us, that cover our lives, that create so much regret and shame and ruin, they can be forgiven because they can be paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come now to the table to partake of these images, these tokens, of your pledge, your commitment to forgive our sins if we come to you in repentance. 
we pray, Father, that you would convince us and overwhelm us with a sense of assurance that the gospel is true and that we repentant sinners can find healing in the wounds of Christ and forgiveness through the provision that you, God, have made for sinners like us. Give to us a holy conviction. Give to us a healthy humility before you. And may you raise us up by the gospel to know there is free and abundant forgiveness for sinners who come to you. We pray together.